Welcome, I'm Lee Cowan, and this is Here Comes the Sun. A closer look at some of the people, places, and things that we bring you every Sunday morning. First off, actress Kirsten Dunst. Her latest film may be a rarity in today's Hollywood, one that combines great story, buzzworthy performances, and a little love from the critics as well. Our Luke Burbank has a look at what drives this versatile actress. One, two, three. I told you I'd teach you. Do you want to know the truth? I felt like, oh my God, this feels so corny right now to be this proper and I'm going to teach you how to dance. Like, I felt a little silly, to be honest. But Dunst had complete faith in director Jane Campion. Yeah, that's better. So she went along. That faith seems to have been well placed as the power of the dog and Dunst's performance in particular are getting rave reviews and even rumors of Oscar consideration. Is everything all right? Yes, ma'am. We'll have more from their conversation later in the show. Excerpts that you'll only find right here on Here Comes the Sun. What you're sort of hoping your legacy is or like what people think of when they think of you. Ultimately, I want my children to grow up and be proud of me and not be embarrassed, you know, that you know, their mom kissed Spider-Man or something like that. Like, I, I just hope that my career doesn't embarrass them at all, <laughs> you know, at school or something. So that's probably, I hope not to embarrass my children. <laughs> Marcel Duchamp's daring work influenced other artistic outliers like Andy Warhol and Jeff Koons, work that sometimes leaves people wondering, is that really art? It has absolutely no aesthetic value. <laughs> It's a dog comb. Yeah, right. if you found it in the gutter, you wouldn't even take it out. So then why did you pay a lot of money to own it? <laughs> because it's a Duchampian statement that art need not be pretty. He's trying to get into your head. We'll be right back. Kirsten Dunst has been in front of the camera for the better part of her life. At three, she was a model. At 11, she played opposite Tom Cruise and Brad Pitt in Interview with the Vampire. That set her on a path to blockbusters like Spider-Man and to critically acclaimed indie films as well. She's in conversation today with our Luke Burbank, where Dunst talks about her new freedom from fear and the wisdom that comes from a lifetime of acting. One, two. Three, to the side. One, two, three, and back. One. Kirsten Dunst remembers shooting a particularly poignant scene from her new film, The Power of the Dog. In it, she and her real life partner, Jesse Plemons, play two deeply lonely people who finally find a connection in 1920s Montana. I want to say how nice it is not to be alone. Do you want to know the truth? I felt like, oh my God, this feels so corny right now to be this proper and I'm going to teach you how to dance. Like, I felt a little silly, to be honest. But Dunst had complete faith in director Jane Campion. Yeah, that's better. So she went along. I'm very director driven, so I would have done anything for Jane. She could have talked about this gray couch and I would have done the movie and played the green pillow. You know what I mean? That's like, her next project. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Reading like, about but, it in variety. <laughs> I really would have done anything for Jane. That faith seems to have been well placed, as the power of the dog and Dunst's performance in particular are getting rave reviews and even rumors of Oscar consideration. Is everything all right? Yes, ma'am. For Dunst, now 39, an Academy Award nomination would be the latest step in a life spent in front of the camera, starting at age three in New Jersey when her mother would drive her into New York City for modeling gigs. Claudia! What have you done? But it was her role at age 11 as Claudia in Interview with a Vampire, opposite Tom Cruise and Brad Pitt, that really put her on the map. Which one of you made me the way I am? What you are? A vampire gone insane that pollutes its own bed. And if I cut my hair again? I mean, even Kids in my school who had never acted before were auditioning, and it was a worldwide search, you know? So that, that was a really, I knew that it would be, yeah, like a, li a life-changing thing. Her star was rising. My dearest family. Fast, with roles in classics like Little Women, 
Mr. Davis said it was as useful to educate a woman as to educate a female cat. Indies, like the Virgin Suicides. We've been waiting for you guys. Hits, like Bring It On. This is not a democracy, it's a cheerocracy. I'm sorry, but I'm overruling you. And blockbusters, you like the Spider-Man <laughs> franchise. <laughs> you have a knack for saving my life. I think I have a superhero stalker. It's interesting, I always felt like this nice safety net going back to Spider-Man. So to speak. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know, realize how on the nose that <laughs> was like a safety web or whatever. I always liked that I got to go back to this like, to this home base of working with these people again. And yet amidst all the outward success, something inside Dunst just didn't feel right. And at age 27, she checked herself into a Utah rehab facility for treatment for depression. I just really was very much more a people pleaser, you know? I think you're just growing up in that industry. You're wanting to do good for the director, wanting to do good for your other act. Like there's a lot of pleasing. And I think that that starts to affect someone unconsciously or whatever and can hit you over the head. And I think that like, you know, it's something that I think is just like part of being a human being, you know? Did you consider walking away from acting at that point? I just knew however I approached acting, it had to change. And so there was like a more cathartic way of entering into a role as opposed to performative. I, I was like freed basically to try anything and not feel fearful at all. That's on display in The Power of the Dog. When her character, Rose Gordon, develops a drinking problem, Dunst resorted to an unusual acting technique. Peter! I would come out of the house a lot in distress in this film and so Yes, spinning around in circles is my is a, a very helpful trick. Closing your eyes and spinning around in circles, like rolling, you're just like, ooh, and then action, I just kind of stumble out of the house. Rose, what's the matter? <laughs> the final product seems to have paid off, with one review saying few actors have played drunk as convincingly or sympathetically. Hello, Phil. The fact that the project let her work with partner oh, and fellow co-star Jesse Plemons was also a plus. You are marvelous, Rose. The couple has lived in Austin, Texas during much of the pandemic, raising their two small boys. And is it just because of less paparazzi attention? No, it's like, it's everything. People yeah. care less because it's not a movie town. They're better with children, the parks are nicer. I just feel like, in general, it's just like I've had a more fun time living here. After a life spent making movies, Dunst understands just how unique this moment is for her. It's like, it has to be a good movie and you have to give a good performance. <laughs> you don't want to be the weakest link. And like, it's like so many things and then everyone has to like it and then it has to be the buzzy one. And it, it, it's a rare thing that this happens. I'm so sorry. I can't seem to play. I, I played in the cinema pit for hours and hours. I'm so, I'm so sorry. But if the Oscars don't come calling? Listen, if it ended tomorrow, I'd figure something else out. I love my life separately. It's not like all of my confidence and everything is wrapped up in this industry. Like, I'm, I think finding Jesse and having children, it gives you a stability and it gives you, when you find your person, like a way that just grounds your, your life. So it feels like a time that like, I can really, really soak things in and appreciate them um, and feel good about them. If you weren't doing this, if you had not become an actor, what yeah. do you think you would have become? We'll get our answer and much more right after the break. Welcome back. Now, here's an extended version of Luke Burbank's wide-ranging interview with actress Kirsten Dunst that you can only find right here on Here Comes the Sun. I'm just curious, do you remember a time in your life when you were not involved in film and television? <laughs> I don't, honestly, no. <laughs> I mean, I've been doing this. My mom, at three years old, I did baby modeling in New York. So I was doing that for a while and then kind of the success snowballed from there. It was like once you've booked a lot of jobs in that, 
um, world, you then, you know, they send you out on commercial auditions. And I booked the first commercial audition I did. So it was kind of like once you become a commercial kid in New York, then you try pilot season in Los Angeles. So it, it's a little bit of like um, when, when you do well, it's, yeah, it's kind of the trajectory. Was it actor. fun? Like what was going through your mind in those early years where you're getting cast in things and, you know, going out on auditions and stuff? Was it all just like exciting and fun? I had a lot of fun. I mean, I don't think my mom would continue doing this with me if I wasn't. It was very, I feel like I was kind of natural at it and had a good time. I was always the kid putting on like the performances for our family at Sunday night dinner. Did you feel as things were progressing for you that there was some point where you were supposed to decide like what kind of actor you wanted to be, what kind of movies you were gonna be in? I think when, you know, I had to learn about film as I was doing it. So it was like I educated myself on, you know, the certain Criterion Collection movies or watching incredible female performances. And so I kind of was educating myself as I was picking my own roles. And so that kind of grew as I was growing. Um, but yeah, I think a lot of a career is just your own personal taste, really, and what, as an actor, you want to um, uh, do next and not fall into some trap of repetition or what interests you. And I think that's a lot on the, the person, the actor. I read somewhere you were talking about how you got into acting so young and, and you sort of wondered if that was always the best thing for you, but then you said, and then you have your own kids and people are saying, oh, your kids should be baby models, and you right. kind of see the fun of it. Yeah. Are you going to have your kids be part of the industry? I wouldn't be opposed because, like, it's kind of like a family business kind of feeling. And I don't think it has to be a negative thing. Do I, am I going to throw my kid in acting? No. If you weren't doing this, if you had not become an actor, what yeah. do you think you would have become? Something in artistic. I mean, I do love interior design. I do, as your daughter does. I do love painting. I love photography. I, I do something creative for sure. You're also a singer. I forgot that you and Jason Schwartzman oh, do yeah. that summer day song. Yeah. That was like on repeat in my house. For really? Like an, oh, the Coconut Records. Oh, Coconut Records, yeah. It's so good. It's so good. You have sung in various things, but I mean, is that something that you would like to put more front and center into your performances? I would love to do a musical movie. I would love that. That would be so fun. Is like this with you? Full dancing, I'd be so down. Yeah. Are I'd you announcing to the writers and directors yeah. of Hollywood <laughs> that you're open for musicals? I'm very open, yeah. Very open. What you're sort of hoping your legacy is, or like what people think of when they think of you? I guess you hope that your films are studied by other film students. I mean, and that some of them are in the Criterion Collection, because that was always my dream. I'm like, well, I haven't really done a good movie if it's not in the Criterion collection to in my opinion at at like a you know when I was learning about film as a teenager so but but ultimately I want my children to grow up and be proud of me and not be embarrassed you know that you know their mom kissed spider-man or something like that like I, I just hope that my career doesn't embarrass them at all <laughs> you know at school or something so that's probably I hope not to embarrass my children <laughs> I'm curious what your journey has been like in terms of being a woman in this industry that's so focused on appearance and things like that. I had heard a story about a producer for Spider-Man trying to take you for some unannounced orthodontic. Well, she's like, my dentist is great. You should check them out. And they're like, you should just fix those. I was like, not going to happen. No, sorry. I just, I just, I think working with Sophia at 16, Sophia Coppola, really gave me a, um, a great confidence that I don't think I would have had had I not worked with her on such a, a, a role that really like was a more sexual role, like where it was more womanly. And the fact that it was Sophia, I think made me feel so good about myself in a way that I don't think many people get to experience because she was a a female director, you know? So because I was in her care and she thought I was beautiful or she liked my teeth or she thought I was cool, having someone I look up to so much think that of me gave me like, I think even like red carpets and stuff. I just dressed like myself where I was myself. I never felt like I had to dress sexy or do anything to please other men because of what I think working with Sophia gave me.
Is that something that you've been able to carry throughout you know, your career now, um, yeah. years later, that kind of confidence? Because that can be really a challenge for people in this industry. I know, it's, and it, it really has, you know? And also I know that, you know, being in this industry, the more, the more you unalter yourself, the better roles you're going to get at the end of the day, you know? I don't, I don't, if my career is based on beauty, which I know it's not, it's, you know, it, maybe when you're younger, it's more about that being the ingenue, but the older you get, I think the more you, um, you are yourself, the better, the better, the more interesting directors want to work with you and the better roles that you get. I had um, read somewhere that you really make it a point, if possible, to work with women directors. Mm -hmm. I'm curious about that experience for you as a woman to work with a, a woman director like Jane Campion versus a, a male director. To me, I just work with the people that I think are the most talented. So I, I'm lucky to have never had that, um, that, that, that feeling of like, it's always been a very natural thing for me to work with other females and other female directors. Jane's like a, f Jane's like one of the great masters of, you know, cinema. She's like incredible. She's one of my dream directors to work with of all time. Um, because I knew that my performance would be in the best hands. And she wants the real truth. She wants the ugly. She wants the messy. She doesn't want the perfect, which is what I love. To be a part of her movie was um, pretty, like, like, that's a check, like, off the list of, you know, like, it's, it's probably going to be one of the most special things I'll be a part of in my life. Up next, the provocative legacy of French-born artist Marcel Duchamp. Step inside the home of this Washington, D.C. couple and you'll find an array of modern artwork by the pioneering artist Marcel Duchamp. It's worthy of a museum. In fact, they donated much of their collection to a museum, the Smithsonian, no less. Rita Braver gives us a look. You both dispute the idea that these beautiful rooms that we're seeing are put together with it's great not taste. It's not beauty. It's not pretty. It's not. Nothing here is pretty. In fact, this stately Georgian home in Washington, D.C. is pretty dazzling. Filled to the brim with cutting-edge contemporary works by the likes of Bruce Nauman. The artist poking you in the eye. <laughs> Marina Abramovich. Is it art? <laughs> Andy Warhol. You just thought it would be really fun to we have a lot it. of pictures we of Whoa. Chairman Mao? He was a great colorist and many more. It's all assembled by a pair of quirky octogenarians. This is amazing. <laughs> Aaron and Barbara Levine. He's a personal injury lawyer. She's a former school teacher and mother of three. I mean, so she'll walk all the way to the sea, the whole, like this. Just don't dare call them collectors. No, I hate it. I, I, I can't, I hate the word collector. It has to do I with money. I buy what I love, okay? I buy what talks to me. I buy what makes me feel emotional and loving. I don't buy it because it fits into my collection. Collection or not, right now, some of the Levine's most That's important cool. works are not on the walls of their home. But at the Hirshhorn Museum, the Smithsonian's showcase for modern art. How does it feel to see this up here and how excited they are about your gift? Wonderful, absolutely wonderful. They have bequeathed the museum one of the most important privately owned troves of the work of Marcel Duchamp, a French-born iconoclast who redefined the very idea of what makes art. It has absolutely no aesthetic value. <laughs> it's a dog comb. Yeah, right. if you found it in the gutter, you wouldn't even take it out. So then why did you pay a lot of money to own it? <laughs> because it's a Duchampian statement that art need not be pretty. He's trying to get into your head. Born in Normandy in 1887 to a family of traditional painters, Duchamp would cause a sensation when his modernist painting, Nude Descending a Staircase, was rejected by an important Parisian art show in 1912. The fact that 
viewers probably found it hard to see a nude or a staircase in it had something to do with its initial rejection. But Hirshhorn director Melissa Chu says the painting was a huge hit when he showed it at the famed New York Armory show a year later. This was really the work that started his reputation in the United States. Yes, and probably helped him to make his decision to stay here in this country. This version of nude, part of the Levine's gift, is actually a copy authorized by Duchamp. He never put much stock in originals. And one of his most famous and outrageous acts involved painting a mustache on copies of Leonardo da Vinci's revered Mona Lisa. He provoked the art world even more in 1917 with Fountain, a urinal he signed with the pseudonym R. Mutt. It was the first of the everyday objects he would later call ready-mades. That's what the definition of a ready-made is. It's the choice of the artist is enough to transfer it from a functional or industrial form into supposed to be aesthetic, but very different from aesthetic in, in general. But those ready-mades became part of his legacy. Things like this hat rack or this piece called with hidden noise. And what is it? It's nothing. It's a ball of string. You pay, what, a dollar and a half at a hardware store, and then he encases it. What's he doing? He's departing. He's dislocating. He's getting you to wonder what the hell's going on. It's worked. I am wondering <laughs> that very thing. And while most people think of Picasso and Matisse, actually it's Duchamp who probably is the most influential artist for younger artists today. I get so excited every time I, I walk in here. And for Aaron and Barbara Levine, there's a joy in making sure that future generations will see work that continues to make people ask questions about the very meaning of art. What's the artist saying? Where's he going? Where's he coming from? They have to do with my perception. How dumb am I that it takes me so long? And those games are enticing. I'm Lee Cowan. Thanks for watching. We'll see you here next time on Here Comes the Sun.